A loved and respected professor at Colgate, Jennifer Bryce is also a brave nonfiction writer. Her essays have appeared in Plowshares and the Gettysburg Review, among others. Her most recent book, the memoir Unlearning to Fly, is a strong, clear narrative about growing up in Alaska that covers everything from her stint as a newspaper journalist to her parents' engagement story. As a professor, she's an inspiration to countless students in her nonfiction classes, the study group she leads, and her writer's conference workshops. Her writing is enviable, to say the least, with her memoir managing to be both humble and riveting at the same time. In a review of Unlearning to Fly, Nina Murray of the Lincoln Journal Star said that every person who graces the pages of her narrative is writ generously, fairly, and kindly, with a fascination that rekindles our own sense of wonder at the lives we think we know most intimately. Jennifer Bryce's work does what great writing can do. It opens up new understandings of our own lives. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful Jennifer Bryce. Thanks so much, Katie. To see you again. Hello and welcome, welcome to opening night of the conference. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Matt, whose birthday it is. You've already heard this, I guess. <laughs> Thank you to Matt and Cody for convening us all. This is the 10th anniversary of my first reading at what was in 2004 still the Chenango Writers Conference. I think Bruce Smith might be the only one in the room who was there then. Yeah. <laughs> who else? Uh, look at this. <laughs> of course. Lots of you were there. I looked exactly the same then as I do now. <laughs> Except that I had brown hair. And my knees were shaking. Now I know I'm among friends and my knees aren't shaking. <laughs> I do wish you all a wonderful, wonderful few days of writing and thinking about writing, talking about writing, planning the writing that you'll do when you get back home. And I also hope that you make time to walk or run on the ski trails and have a glass of wine on the Mallow House porch. I'm going to read three teeny tiny pieces and they are really, really, really small. The first is just a vignette. It's only two paragraphs. Um, it's about my father in honor of Father's Day, and it comes from a much, much longer piece titled Blue Storm. So in the 50 years my father's been a pilot, there have been two occasions when he says he would have felt safer leaping from the plane with a parachute than continuing to fly. This is just the first one. It was on a flight from Kotzebue in the Northwest to Fairbanks in the interior. A toothy grin of a mountain range known as the Brooks separates Arctic Alaska from the milder climate zone to the south. In the 60s, pre-flight weather briefings in rural Alaska were sketchy to non-existent. At best, pilots who were planning to fly consulted pilots who'd flown recently. At worst, they held a spit-dampened finger up to the wind to see how quickly it dried. Shortly after my father, by then a 200-hour pilot, that's, that's the most dangerous time in a pilot's career, it's when you have just enough confidence to get into trouble, <laughs> took off in the egg-yolk yellow balanca, thunderstorms checkerboarded the sky. For a while, he slalomed between them, a time and fuel consuming tack. Then he thought, what the hell? How bad can it be? The answer turned out to be pretty bad. Inside the Thunderhead, visibility drop dropped to zero. Heavy rain turned to hailstones the size of golf balls. Somehow, my father flew out the other side. After landing in Fairbanks, he dismounted on spaghetti legs. Grabbing a wind to steady himself, he saw something so strange it took him a minute to figure out what it was. The hail had blasted all the yellow paint off the wings, cowling, and fuselage. The balanca was now the color of fog. That's my father. Does this sound okay, this light? Yeah. Louder? Close, like closer to the mic? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. 
I told I told John Robert Lemon I would I would look at him for a sound check and I forgot. So the last two squibs are about the two women I grew up between. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. My mother and my grandmother, they formed the dialectical poles of my life. From my earliest memory, these two women, both of them devout Episcopalians, were engaged in a fierce struggle for possession of my soul. <laughs> By which I probably mean something much more prosaic, like my sense of self or even just my allegiance, but I like the word soul better. Anyway, it was a fight that did me no harm and quite possibly some good. I was one of five children and 21 first cousins on my father's side. The fight between my grandmother and my mother was mostly subterranean, but occasionally it broke out into the open. There was a real knockdown drag out over China versus paper plates at my wedding reception. <laughs> <laughs> but it made me feel from a very young age as if my soul was something <coughs> worth fighting for. So here's the first, the first little squib. It's, it's a little longer than the last one, which is really, really short. A few Christmases ago, one of my aunts sent me some dog-eared books tied up in red velvet. They were books about writing, and they had belonged to my grandmother. She'd scrawled her name across the flyleaf of Annie Dillard's The Writing Life, and she'd marked this passage among others. You were made and set here to give voice to this, your own astonishment. My grandmother's astonishment, that gave me pause. It's true she gave voice to big emotions, passion, fear, betrayal, love, joy, anger, envy, exhaustion, but astonishment? I never saw her so much as nonplussed. She once carried a clutch of us grandchildren from Alaska to Florida, but forgot her swimsuit. Like sea turtle hatchlings, the littlest ones struck out for open water. She plunged in after them, wearing only a girdle. Born in the Gilded Age before the First World War, Helen McNutt trained at a Georgia conservatory before marrying my grandfather, bearing four sons, moving to California, and styling herself a wartime radio reporter and political gadfly. Years later, she became president of an Alaska company that built roads and runways and boat harbors. She changed her name from Helen to Alenka, lowercase h, emphasis on the middle syllable, Alenka. <laughs> she turned a ramshackle orphanage on 80 acres into the family estate, bright in the hills. Every 4th of July, she threw a party for 300 people that featured Lady Liberty galloping on a white stallion with the Union Jack flapper, flapping in howling proximity to the hot dog grill. What else? My grandmother drank single malt scotch, had great legs, and took lovers into her 70s. A lifelong Democrat, she was godmother to the daughter of one of the U.S. Senate's most powerful, longest-serving Republicans, Ted Stevens. Long before cell phones, she had a two-way radio installed in her car, and she used the Radio Fairbanks dispatcher as a human Rolodex. She once prevailed on a state trooper who pulled her over for speeding to escort her home to retrieve her driver's license. She wept over trifles. And wherever she went, she trailed beauty like perfume. When we traveled by freighter to South America, she brought along six trunks full of clothes, crystal, silver, linens, and books. The boundaries between truth and fiction, between what happened to her and what happened to a character in a novel she'd read, were sometimes a little bit porous. Reading Faulkner, she became Caddy Compson. Reading Edna St. Vincent Millay, she became the poet burning her candle from both ends. No one in my family ever dared call my grandmother a liar. Instead, we used to say she never let the facts get in the way of a good story. One time when the two of us were in Paris, she found out that Richard Nixon was staying at our hotel, the Crillon. 
wild horses could have dragged her out of the lobby. <laughs> I stayed with her. What else could I do? I was only 16 and curious to see disgrace up close. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Nixon, she said, sticking out her hand. He took it. Is it, is it cutting in and out? No. no? Oh. He took it, startled, and she said, I haven't seen you since I covered your house race in California way back in 46. In my memory, the Secret Service, a study in black suits and white shirts, leaned in. At the center of the circle was my grandmother in her silk scarf and camel coat, her coiffed head tilted a little to the side, her eyes wide with innocence. The little liar. In my memory, I stepped back, not wanting to see what would happen next. What happened next was that the great man took her one hand in both of his, looked directly into her face, and said, it's a pleasure to see you again, Helen. So much has happened since then. Are you well? You look well. Over the quarter century when our lives overlapped, my grandmother wrote me hundreds of letters. Sometimes she wrote from far away when she was traveling, but sometimes she wrote from just across town. She wrote to criticize, cajole, exhort, or praise, mostly though she wrote in order to talk about what she was reading. My memory is a sieve that lets meaning slip through, but catches the way the words were configured on the page. They sped up and slowed down with the waxing and waning of her thoughts. They blossomed and shrank, squashed up against the right margin or tumbled off the page. They curled, irrepressible as vines, up the left side and over the top. I found my grandmother's letters, like my grandmother herself, embarrassing. She wasn't really writing to me, I think but to some imaginary version of me that she'd propped up in front of her like a mirror. The potted plant wrote stiff replies to wild nature. It sought out weakness and once memorably found it. I addressed an envelope in her married name. I am not Mrs. Luther Liston Bryce, she sputtered via return post. I am Alenka Bryce. Now a college professor, I lead a somewhat colorless life. I never let a story get in the way of good facts. My idea at the end of a long day is to read expedition novels. My favorites are the ones with tragic or doomed in the title, Mountain of My Fear, Into Thin Air, Frozen in Time, the land of white death. <laughs> My grandmother's passion for letter writing took the form of profuse exuberance, a wild and fertile superabundance of verbiage. In me, the impulse, I don't dare call it passion, to write is narrow and constrained, more of an affliction that must be borne as an ingrown toenail. A few months after my grandmother died, thick manila envelopes addressed to me in her secretary's hand started turning up in the mail. I opened only the first. Copies of Alenka's letters to me exploded onto the counter. And a shabby thought bubbled up. This was my grandmother's way of hectoring me from the grave to write about her. I wasn't going to do it. I stuffed the rest of the letters back into the envelope unread. But last summer, rifling through my files for a child's shot record, there you are, <laughs> I came upon my grandmother's letters in a high box on my closet shelf. I read one, and hours later, I was still sitting on my closet floor surrounded by carbon copies. Her handkerchief was too good for the likes of me. I mopped up my tears with the tail of my t-shirt. It seems my grandmother's letters weren't all about her, as I'd always thought. They weren't about me either. They were conversations between the woman she was and the writer she expected me to become. She died in 1992. 
What took you so long, I imagined her saying, astonished. <laughs> And this last, bit, this last bit is really, really short. It, it got solicited by NPR for a program called State of the Reunion, which I think nobody has ever heard. But it had to be written in the form of a letter to my hometown. I don't think it's going to stay in that form. It, seems, it just seems a little precious to me, but I haven't had time to change it. So, so it's, it is written in the form of a letter to Fairbanks which I guess would be obvious from the opening line, which is, Dear Fairbanks. <laughs> <laughs> of course I had to leave you. I had to leave the way every girl has to leave her mother to see the possibilities for her own self. In the summer of 61, you were my mother's magnetic north. She said goodbye to New York City, goodbye to nursing school, goodbye to the boy who'd taken back his room. Two weeks later, she pulled into a gas station in her Plymouth Valiant, asked, how do I get to Fairbanks from here? Lady, the guy said, you just drove through it. <laughs> Two years later, my mother pushes a pram down 2nd Avenue. Stay, she says to the husky at her side, then steps inside the co-op. While she's gone, the husky and I swap stories on the sidewalk. My first memory is from August 1967, the Chena River flood. Mom rouses me from sleep, then swings me, whoopsie-daisy, into a stranger's arms. The man paddles my family to safety. A year or so later, on a rainy day, a stranger offers me a ride home from kindergarten. Something about him reminds me of the man with the canoe. I say yes. With the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, you got a whole new lexicon, Paul Road, crude oil, dead fork, and one or two new jokes. Happiness is 10,000 Okies heading south with a Texan under each arm. <laughs> it seemed like all the boys dropped out of school at 16. Why study economics when you could work for union scale? Then I was 16, and the boys were back. Dana Button and I cruised airport way in her orange bug blasting the Bee Gees, staying alive. On prom night, it was 50 below, the roads dense with busted fan belts like a plague of black snakes. I wore pink chiffon and silver sandals because, hey, in Fairbanks, we dress for the occasion. <laughs> Fast forward a few more years, the news miner carries a front page story about Lori King, my best friend back in sixth grade. Did I tell you that the stranger who picked me up in his Ford Granada all those years ago drove me straight home? Do I need to tell you that Lori King was not so lucky? Dear Fairbanks, when I was young, I didn't see you as beautiful. Like my mother, you just were. Winter nights, she'd wrap me in blankets and trundle me outdoors. Look up, she'd say, as roll after roll of ribbon unfurled across the sky. The northern lights, aren't they wonderful? Nothing seemed wonderful to me then. Nothing, I should say, except the sight of my no-nonsense, loafers-wearing, public health nurse mother, unmoored by beauty. For her sake, I looked up and fell into the sea until soon. Thank you.